All right, thank you, Scott. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm going to try not to come too hard out of the gate for two reasons. Number one, um, I planned poorly, and I ended up sprinting here from the football stadium, um, which, if you're wondering, Rich's book is a lot easier to carry than the other one. Um, <laughs> so it was, a, it was a fun run. That was uphill, too. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the, the other thing is um, I have the pleasure of being up here, but I really uh, – this is kind of a fanboy moment for me. I, uh, they had to sit through lunch with me, um, and I have loved both of these books. I've loved – the work that these three individuals have done uh, their entire career. So this is a huge honor for me to be a part of this. Um, so, uh, but y'all don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from uh, the authors of these uh, fantastic books. And, and, you know, one of the things that we're going to try and tie in is, is tell a little bit of the story behind the book, right? Um, what brought you to this, uh, to, to writing these books? What did you learn about it? And then try and figure out what we can learn into the future, right? We know that a lot of this is, um, is about history. It's about decisions that have been made, right? We are sitting on the Mississippi River Delta where our lives are shaped by decisions made hundreds and thousands of years ago uh, in the city of New Orleans where our decisions and our power system sometimes are from hundreds of years ago. Um, and so we're going to think a little bit about the past but also the future. So I want to start um, uh, with Rich. Um, you always have a project going on. You're always, uh, at, at lunch, we said that you're always pregnant with something. Um, <laughs> and this book uh, seems to have always been written. It seems like you have, you, you have always talked from this book, but what made you decide to finally sit down and write it? How did this come together? What, what made you uh, put all of your energy and your uh, limited amount of time into putting this book together? Yeah, there was a proximate cause and an ultimate cause. The ultimate cause, you already addressed that in having studied the geography of this region for uh, nearly 30 years now, this was the single biggest, almost literally a watershed moment. That circa 1900, drainage of the back swamp, and what changed, it was the city that was shaped like a crescent, thus the nickname, to a 20 mile by 10 mile spread eagle shape of a metropolis that expanded dangerously regardless of hydrology and topography. The proximate cause that brought me to the story was uh, a colorful individual, and this city produces them, uh, by the name of George Andrew Hero, who I came across while researching my previous uh, major project, which was uh, historical geography of the West Bank. Uh, and very briefly, George Hero was known uh, citywide as the drainage king. Uh, he was born in the 1850s, and uh, after retiring a millionaire, having uh, played the, the cotton futures, uh, took up a, a kind of um, uh, avocation that became a vocation of buying up land on the West Bank and using all this newfangled drainage technology to drain the West Bank. And he did it with style and flair. Uh, and uh, he was uh, only a New Orleans character. So after I finished that book and with a couple of side projects, uh, I decided to um, look more deeply into him, possibly doing a biography just on George Hero. And I quickly came to see that there wasn't quite enough there for a whole book. But in looking into his role in draining the West Bank, it became the perfect opportunity to tell this larger story in the book as a result. And, you know, Rich, the, your book starts, you know, so far in the past and, and starts with, um, you know, kind of how we got to where we are um, in New Orleans. And it, it crescendos, right, um, with, you know, the boy from Plain Dealing and Wagner and Ball and the Urban Water Plan, which is just celebrating its 10-year anniversary. And in many ways, Margarita and Inyake, your big book picks up um, from that point, not in New Orleans. Most of it is set in Spain. Um, where, where both of you hail from, um, are Paris through Spain. Um, and, and one of the um, things that I found so exciting about it was um, it shows, you know, we think a lot about this. We, we see the problems that we have in, in New Orleans. We see the challenges that we have. But your book was, was light and airy in terms of what the possibility is. And, and so tell me, obviously, this, this work represents a lot of your work, but a lot of, you know, partners. How did you guys come to, to put this down, to say we're going to build... Um, a big and be heavy, um, <laughs> but beautiful nonetheless, and inspiring book. Um, what, what made you sit down uh, to put away the CAD drawings, to put away the pen, um, and get to the keyboard on this? Uh, thank you, Bo. Um, I mean, from our side, uh, the main driver is to share, 
to share uh, the experience of the things we have built over the last 25 years and the struggles we have had for uh, integration of cities and rivers, yes? especially floods in urban environments. So that, that has been uh, a journey and we've failed in some cases and uh, succe succeed in others. So we just wanted to share that in the context of academia, in the context of, uh, among uh, professionals, etc. So it's, it's just an adventure of, of, of a willingness to share most of it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, okay, do you want to add? Yeah, and, and also that perhaps that the design is action, and of course action and reflection is a loop of correcting yourself and, and trying and testing and, and the design. I, I tell my students that I'm sorry you get into these uh, studies. Uh, you have to know that you will be always wrong. <laughs> you, you can always improve your design. So it's a curse that we have as designers. So it's a, it's a process of reflection and action, but doing the book is also stepping back and having a reflection in a much larger time frame and seeing a whole set of ideas evolving over time and where we are now and where we want to continue going. That's great. You know, uh, Iñaki and, and Margarita, in the opening of your book, you talk about your work kind of sitting at the confluence of uh, the building of landscape and the public space, kind of sitting in that unclaimed commons and how you're uh, trying to explain that. And, and I see both of these books um, uh, as, as sitting in between the space of, of you know, textbooks and academia that we should all learn. Any of us who work or live in these spaces, we should study these books and we should learn from them. But they also sit in between the space of, of inspiration and art um, and, and really uh, uh, get towards the, uh, the, you know, the, the more uh, uh, you know, carnal um, uh, ideas of how we can be inspired to, to do better into the future. Rich, you are a fountainhead of, of knowledge in this space and in many others, right? Um, but I have to think that all of these books don't just write themselves, right? Um, that you didn't just say, okay, finally, I'm going to sit down and write it, but that you learned and you went on a journey through this process. So, so talk us through some of the things that you learned, either about the, the particular characters in the book, about um, yourself, about your work, or about the opportunities or the challenges that you yeah. didn't know. Well, for one thing, uh, we had a remarkable, at least in its planning, not necessarily its execution operation, gravity-driven series of drainage systems from 1722 up to 1835. Uh, why 1722? Four years after the founding of the city, that's when the street grid of the French Quarter was laid out by Adrien de Poget, and built into that was the, the uh, digging of ditches and gutters deep enough. So uh, the way you do it is you uh, section off your square, you dig ditches around it, you take that spoil, you mount up your square where people are actually going to live, the gutters capture the runoff, it drains out the topsoil, and then you have to steer that uh, through the back swamp. And you know, it, it, very intricately, we have these amazing engineers who uh, were able to plan out for this and do exactly what Inyaki Margarita and others are recommending. And what you want to do in an environment like this, a riverine deltaic environment, is you want to capture and store as much pluvial water, that is rainfall, on the landscape as possible, disperse it out, slow down its movement, store it, make those storage areas scenic as amenities, and slowly let it percolate out to the inevitable outfalls that you're going to have to build. Uh, probably one of the best examples of Bartholomew Lafon. Uh, quite a character, quite a man of multi-talented, classically trained. If you know the Lower Garden District, that's his masterpiece. And a key component of the Lower Garden District was what we would call sustainable urban water management. He would capture the uh, flow off the natural levee, intercept it along Coliseum Square, and then direct it down Melpamine, okay? And that was going to flow scenic with trees along the edges. It was going to go to Nyad Street, the water nymphs. That's now St. Charles Avenue. From there, it was going to fork out down a natural bayou, Bayou Cons. This drained the lower garden district, and it flowed roughly uh, down about Calliope Street. And the rest would be steered gravitationally around Tivoli Circle, later Lee Circle, now Harmony Circle, and then out uh, Howard Avenue. And this explains why Howard Avenue was designed so wide. 
and all of this would just flow gravitationally uh, <coughs> to, to the back swamp, which is where it flowed anyway. So what began to change this, and to answer your question I broke, I like to use my chapter breakouts to tell the larger story. So if you don't want to buy, buy the book, just look at the table of contents and you'll get a good idea. <laughs> and so what changes in that first era, which, which I, uh, I call the, 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 uh, the uh, gravity and drainage uh, ditching era, you dig the ditch, you let gravity do it. The next one is the polder and paddle era. And the change here is the introduction of steam energy, steam, steam engines. So now you could cheat gravity and speed up gravity by having machines doing some of the pushing and lifting. These weren't lift pumps yet. They were, uh, it was kind of like a, a, a mountain grist mill in reverse. Instead of the water coming down from the mountains and turning the wheel, the steam engine would kind of spank the water out, paddle the water out by you St. John. So that's the next era up until the 1890s, and that's when we get the system that we have today. That's right. And if you, if you should buy the book, uh, if you haven't already. Um, but as Rich was saying, the ditch and gravity area, the polder and paddle, the plagues and progress, the capers and consequences, the progressive era, dewatering New Orleans, geography's rearranged, drainage becomes a utility, the feds wade in, love the pun, <laughs> the only thing that can mess up, mess us up, the early 2000s. That's in quotes from Joe Sullivan. Exactly. And what he was referring to was subsidence. Right. And rewatering New Orleans, which is where we end. So rewatering... Um, and which, which you know, in, at the end of this, this book, we, we go from um, some of the uh, progress and pitfalls of drainage, right? You say um, at the outset that drainage begets floods and floods beget drainage. But in Yaki and Margarita, your book shows so many examples of how we can, um, not to borrow from the Dutch, but give room for rivers, right? Give room for this space to go, but not just think of it in a vacuum as, as stormwater or, or havens for mosquitoes, but think about it as a public asset, um, as, as a public opportunity, as an educational and an inspirational opportunity. Um, flooding bull rings and, and uh, fantastic um, uh, and, and beautiful images that can really enliven cities. Um, but again, I'm sure the two of you, as brilliant and, and as talented as you are, didn't just regurgitate, you know, sitting in COVID saying, well, let's put everything down on paper, right? You, this had to have been a journey for you as well. So talk us through um, what you learned about, about yourself, about your, your company, um, and, and about how you can inspire work uh, here at Tulane. I think, I mean, water infrastructure is, is uh, the big, the backbone of any a life body is the blood of any body, so it, it's it's the source or the base of any landscape or any form of life. So there's different ways of integrating the uh, skeleton of water infrastructure into not only the landscape but the cities as well. So we can see different spatial organization. Our we're designers, we are specialists in integrating infrastructure at the human scale. So in a way that inspires people, it makes poetry out of it. So because it's it's a need for us to somehow reform the built environment in a way that deals with the uh, pitfalls of climate change. But the integration can be large scale and scary and ugly, or it can be small and, and uh, human scale and poetic. So I think that, that, that uh, so what we have learned is, is somehow the power of design at human scale and the power of integration and cohabitation with dynamics, natural dynamics. You know, uh, go ahead. I, I don't think this was intended, right? But um, because a lot of these books came together around the pandemic, and and so we were, if you were talking, you were doing so through Zoom, uh, or a or a tin can and a and a uh, piece of wire. But um, I found these books kind of speaking to one another, right? And I'll I'll read a line from Inyaki and Margarita's book that I think could have come from Rich's book as well. Uh, the result of conquering the territory to build our cities has meant eliminating uncontrollable natural, dy natural dynamics from the urban space. This process has ended up transforming our urban rivers into sterile canals, often polluted and treated as drainage and sewage lines. The increase in catastrophic floodings all around the planet is one of the first wake-up calls about climate change and demonstrates the limits and consequences of this way of building a city. At the same time, a new ecological sensibility, aware that the planet has no backyards, 
where our waste miraculously disappears or which unlimitedly satisfies our demand for resources highlights the loss of quantity of life and imminent risk. I think that's a beautiful line, a beautiful series of lines, and I think it, it really ties together these two books. And so, you know, if we had a blank canvas, right, if we had a blank canvas in the city of New Orleans on the Mississippi River Delta, um, I, I think this would be an easy conversation, but we don't. We're always working from, uh, you know, the, the mistakes and the, and, and the triumphs of, of the past. So, Rich, when you look at um, the, the history and the, the ripped and torn and tattered and painted on canvas that we have uh, in New Orleans, where do, you see, where do you see opportunity? Where do you see opportunity to take the knowledge in, in your book and in Inyaki and Margarita's book to, you know, to the people in the community, to the people around the community, to those of us who work in the space? Where can we take this? Um, well, one, th one place we could take it is by um, learning the lessons of the past and not making, not repeating those mistakes. And uh, toward that end, I would recommend uh, reclaiming and draining no more land. We have a metropolis, a city that was designed for over, we had 627,000 people in 1960. Now we're, I think, 370. Uh, so I have a hard time uh, understanding why we'd, we would need to dewater any more land. We have the space already. Uh, a couple of other things I would point to, and Yaki mentioned how in design practice, you're always wrong. You could always do better. And I think that's a very healthy process and mindset to go through. The r opposite of that, when that doesn't happen, is unforeseen consequences. Mm -hmm. Another uh, uh, aspect of that is this phenomenon that's known to economists and geographers and others as path dependency. And path dependency is when you make a series of decisions, and maybe they were the, based on the best information at the time, but they establish a path that limits the range of options that you have further down the line, and so that you keep making what you know to be bad decisions because you, are, you don't quite have the funding and the ability to extricate yourself from that path and then go back and get it right. And let me uh, make um, one example here, a remarkable moment in that 1893-95 document that is the plan, the, the, the roadmap and the blueprint for our modern drainage plan. The engineers researching it contemplated very carefully going back and forth, weighing the pros and cons, should the outfall, the ejection of our water from the main uptown bowl, should it go eastward through Bayou Bienvenue to Lake Bourne, or should it go northward into Lake Pontchartrain? Now, I think many of you know how the story ends. It goes northward to Pontchartrain, but that's not what they decided. They decided to go eastward through Bienvenue to Lake Bourne, and they had articulate and even almost surprisingly progressive reasons for doing so. They didn't want to pollute the water at West End and Spanish Fort. They were recreational areas. That was one of them. And so um, what, what this drove, the path that this established, was the placement of the pumping stations along the Broad Street Corridor. And if you link up all our original 1900, uh, circa 1900 pumping stations, it's a connect the dots to go straight eastward. Only later, when we excavated the industrial canal, it became a bottleneck, Lakeview and Gentilly proved to need most of the dewatering, was that system then rewired to go northward, and the pumps by then, path dependency, you can't move them. They should have been placed at the perimeter. Instead, they're in the middle of the city. The rest of the city started to sink below live, uh, sea level. You're already raising the water too early. Once you're raising it in a sinking bowl, you have to keep it high. When you go through Gentilly and Lakeview, you look up to drainage canals. You look up to drainage canals. Two of those breached catastrophically during Katrina, and that's when we paid the price for having dropped below sea level. Inyake, so when you see, uh, obviously, we think of New Orleans as very old. Right, uh, that you know, all of us were we're they're sitting. from Ma Madrid and Paris. Exactly, <laughs> you know. So we we think of it as you know, I'm sitting here trying to figure out the termite damage in my house and figure out where it's settling and all these things, um, and I think we look at it as a challenge here in New Orleans um, and say, well, well, there's all these decisions that have been made, but you guys are working in 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 ancient uh, <laughs> civilizations in many cases, but yet you and and as you've detailed in your book, you've been able 
um, uh, to really rethink some of those public spaces. And you've done so by reclaiming areas, like I'm thinking about in San Juan, reclaiming areas that have been lost or um, you know, repurposing some of these areas. So when you living and working here in, in New Orleans and seeing um, you know, kind of our, our baby land, 7,000 years old, and our, and our little history of a couple hundred years, right? And you think about how you've been able to learn lessons and put into ground and put into place lessons in Spain. Um, what are some of the projects that, that really um, uh, uh, come to mind as, as ones that when, when everybody in this room goes and buys a copy of this book and then tries to run across campus with it, <laughs> what page should they turn to? Where should they go to see something inspirational or something that we can learn from? You don't have to cite the page number, I don't <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I think that all, all the projects are imperfect and they have successes and we keep monitoring every one of our public spaces that that floats and, and we are very scared every time we see a flood coming in the websites of the uh, watershed authorities and we monitor performance and we think in what would be the, the, the adjustments uh, to make. And there's, there's plenty more in that because someone can say, oh, your work is about taking out dikes and making space for the river in the public space and the city, but obviously the city is very complex and you cannot do that just like that. People who are already there have to stay there. So how you compromise in a way, I think that's probably the interesting thing is how you compromise. So sometimes in the, in the where are we going, uh, we are going to, we have to deal with, with climate change and all the social impact in the most vulnerable population. That's, that's where we go. But the question sometimes is how, no? Mm -hmm. uh, so we work very closely with, with engineers, with, uh, with people at the school, uh, Richard, of course, um, and scientists. And I think that what the kind of work that designers do is, is complementary in the sense of we are looking at desired futures instead of at just expected futures. So what do we need to change things, to transform, to look for the desired futures? Our work is also meant to action, not, not to study and put the facts, but also to, to make actions. And, and it deals with, with the human scale and with the complexity of the city. That I think is the, the, the thing that we can help more, that we, that we put together all these layers of contradictions and con counter interests that are in the city because we all have different desires or needs. So, so the work is of, of the design is trying to be these iterations in trying to put together all these contradictions and, and the projects of the book show uh, these contradictions they wanted in our first project ever they wanted us to design a bullfight arena which for you sounds crazy and it is That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we proposed that the bullfight arena was going to be an amenity inside the park as opposed to be a building and that bullfight arena would float as the as all the riverbanks should float which is completely counterintuitive and it's illegal by the way um, but we managed to get through the water uh, authority and, and dealt with that contradiction. So all the work is about how we deal with all these dynamics that are typically catastrophic and instead of being a catastrophe, they are uh, a plus, a maintenance. We say that uh, the rivers do maintenance of the park as opposed to us trying to fix what the rivers do. Margarita, you know, it, uh, Taking that, uh, you know, kind of, we'll call it, take from the Dutch and say give room for the river, right? You know, I had the pleasure of going over to the Netherlands last year and seeing a bunch of the room for the river projects where they are allowing, um, you know, the rivers in the Netherlands to, 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 you know, reclaim space so that they don't flood the cities, but they have areas flood. Um, one of your projects back in 2004 uh, was, was one of the precursors of that, that, that in the Rotterdam Challenge that, that really helped the Dutch uh, coalesce around this this room for the river, um, and now here at Tulane, you are in the in the process of building um, both a an engineering and a design conversation and 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 degree track. Um, because while you know, Rich, we'll get back to the to the stormwater and the localized within the Hydra system, but we are also on a dynamic delta um, that 
it has been fixed in place uh, effectively since 1927. In 1973, it tried to wrestle its way out of that fixture. Um, but this is an area that you were looking at, is, is, is looking at what can we do with this river. And one thing that you know very well is the Army Corps of Engineers just authorized or was authorized to conduct a five-year, $25 million study. And one of the primary questions there is, can we dynamically manage the Mississippi River to balance all of its needs, floods, navigation, ecosystem restoration? So tell me a little bit about how you're taking your experiences from Spain and the projects and bringing that down so that Tulane and Louisiana and this delta um, can can lead from the front on a dynamic uh, river system. I mean, I don't have the solution, but <laughs> I have an attitude. So I think we, we, we are really invested into education. Mm -hmm. So we're uh, opening up this dual uh, masters of landscape and engineering, collaborating with the School of Engineering, so School of Architecture, uh, and the built environment with the School of Engineering, uh, with IHAB Meselge as a co-director, and launching this dual masters and that combines the specificity of hydraulics and hydrology and, and with landscape who, and, you know, the discipline understands very much the dynamic uh, performances of the landscape. So we're, we're invested into education on that, on that dual masters launching on summer 25. And then uh, in terms of the the delta and the conditions here are really complex, and I wouldn't jump and say anything about it because I don't know enough. I don't know, but I know that there are new paradigms of cohabitation and, and landscapes in flux that we can learn to cohabit with. And I think it's, it's just a, a different way of inhabiting a territory that we will have to learn. Um, and so maybe picking up on what you said before about the backyard i think it's 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 really interesting that in, in that quote you mentioned on this on the book you're we're saying that we as designer we like to see backyards disappear from the planet for for what that means for us is that uh, backyards typically contain large quarries or landfills or things that we don't want to see that they're there and they are increasingly large in scale so our fight as designers is to try to integrate these, um, these processes into the built environment. Let's say ambition of landfill zero, or it's an ambition that can be resolved through design. So I think that that, that idea is what obsesses us, is to, is to make the territory globally equal for all citizens in the same way. So not having citizens of first class, second class, third class but citizens that are equally treated, so no backyard. <laughs> it's a, a goal. When you launch the applications for the uh, program, if there's a night program, <laughs> get ready for my application. Um, the, you know, Rich, I want to, uh, before we turn to audience questions, I want to uh, remark a little bit on one of the things that your book shifted in my brain. And I work in this space every day and have my entire career. Um, I always thought that the risk and the challenges that we have here in Louisiana, we're very much of a, a local vor flavor. You know, these are things that, uh, you know, why do those people live down there on that delta? Well, if the, you know, if if you're looking up to drainage canals, what, what, why are you doing this? And one of the things that you you started this book, right? You didn't start with George here. You started back with you, or, or you did, but you went back to 1699, right? You went back to Bienville and Iberville, and you went back to uh, the financier and swindler John Law, sending them across. Um, uh, to the new world, and this place, and you did uh, this a lot in, in Bienville's Dilemma, obviously, as well, but this place where we are on this delta with Lake Pontchartrain behind us in this area is not just relevant to us and relevant to the school and relevant to this community, but it has for centuries now been relevant to the world. And one of the things that I found inspiring was not just that um, we are handling these challenges and sometimes we get them right and sometimes we get them wrong. But for centuries, this has been the place that thought and innovation um, and inspiration from this water and pain and tragedy around this water has emanated from. And so that we are all bearers of this, this story. And I read your book and I slammed it down and I ran off you know, to work. I was ready to go, right? It was, it, 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 and I don't know if you meant it to be a, a call to action, but it, it, it helped me uh, center around, yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have storms. Yes, we have floods. 
Yes, we have saltwater wedges, which we've had since before the 1940s. This is not a new thing. Um, but we have all these challenges. But with those challenges, Marcus Aurelius says the obstacle is the way, right? We have opportunity. So talk a little bit, continue to bring us through out of the last chapter of that book, out of the rewatering. Where, where can we go from here and where can communities and community activists and engineers and scientists and thinkers and lawyers take this and reclaim our identity as the, the focal point of water knowledge and thought? The, the way I'd address the, the mindset perhaps we need to have for the future is going back to before 1699 um, and when there was indigenous uh, occupancy in this area, an area that they called Balbancha, which means roughly uh, a land of many tongues. Uh, why so? Because indigenous populations from a far away as Biloxi and Mobile and points eastward and uh, well up the river and, and uh, westward uh, to the Natchez and the Tunica were able to traverse here because there were so many opportunities for comings and goings. And they had two cultural economies here, two geographical bases. Uh, one was on the higher ground along the river where they established built environments uh, with architecture and, and agriculture. And the other ones were in the coastal areas and their main source of protein was um, shellfish and finfish. And they actually built their own topography by creating middens with all the discarded shells. And uh, the way to link this pre-colonial story to the future, I think, is that the, uh, the perception of the in indigenous population to water here is that they viewed it not as a problem to be solved, but as a condition mm. to be lived with and adapted to. Europeans arrived here with the imperatives of imperialism and colonialism, which is occupancy, and so water on the landscape was viewed very much as a problem to be solved to which we would bring to bear our engineering acumen and, and introduce rigidity to this landscape of fluidity. Rigidity in the form of levees and barriers and walls and canals and later on pumps and mechanized means. And here we are 300 years later and if you listen to the commonalities in the diction here and the, the verbs and nouns, it's meeting the native perception halfway. It's understanding that we need to make room for the river, that it, the water on those areas is a condition that we should accept. That's beautiful. Inyaki, you know, one of the things we have to balance in, in uh, New Orleans in particular is um, the gray and the green, right? The condition and the drainage, right? We have to, we have created needs in this community um, and in many communities um, that, that, you know, maybe we wish we could go uh, backwards. But with, with all of the uncertainties of climate change and sea level rise and subsidence, um, how do you try and encourage your students and, and the, the, the minds that are coming through this, uh, this ecosystem to, to, balance that uh, to balance that uncertainty and, and, and navigate the gray and the green? How do you, how do you handle uncertainty in this country? <clears throat> uh, thank you. Well, so um, first, uh, rethink the question. So for instance, uh, we, are, we are building the most expensive streets in the world, because we basically are building structures of concrete, most expensive than any other city in the world, because we need that stability. Because if not, we have all the potholes and all that. And we are not the densest city and not the richest city at all. And what we are doing with that is what we are making our streets perfectly uh, impermeable, perfectly waterproofed. So then we have water that is on top of this very expensive layer of concrete that floats us while our soil dries and we sink. So starting with the question of where do we want the water to be? Uh, so for instance, we are working and, and Richard is, is, is helping us uh, with a group of students, a master's thesis uh, last year doing a thesis about can we imagine that we can build our streets much cheaper and as sponges that absorb the water instead of pumping them up. In a kind of theoretical model, we have reached to a conclusion that we could pump once every three years if we do that as systematically in the city. So 
so it's about rethinking the question, no? It's not about, okay, we need to storage and then send it. Why? We can think in a completely different way. So is that um, just a, a, a hypothesis uh, and a kind of impossible ideal situation? Or more, more difficult things have happened, no? So, so we are optimistic that the School of Architecture, or the, the universities are the places to, to generate ideas and knowledge that may or may not be applicable in the moment that may open new ways of thinking. And that's what our students are doing, which are very, they, this is a School of Architecture that is taking on the entire built environment and which is very focused in dealing with the, with the important problems of today. I'm going to get one more question in before I turn it over to the audience. Margarita, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we're, we've talked about the gray infrastructure, we talked about green infrastructure, we talked about water and the dynamism and uncertainty. Um, being the lawyer on the stage, right, there is the whole regulatory framework that you have to go through. There is, there is an, an arcane uh, legal system. There's a home rule charter. There's the way we have always done it and the inertia of that. Um, having... Uh, put forth some, uh, you know, transformative and revolutionary pro uh, projects. What have you seen are some of the things that can break through some of that inertia at the at the the regulatory level to try and have, um, as a you know former you know, government lawyer like we're not we're we're not paid to think outside the box. How can you use design um, and inspiration around this to push the regulatory uh, conversation forward? Yeah, I may take the example of the bullfight, actually, <laughs> arena that just Iñaki mentioned was illegal. So it's illegal as a bullfight arena, but it's not as an open-air uh, facility in a park. So, you know, if you reframe, again, the typology, architectural typology of this build form, uh, then it passes, uh, it, it, it complies with the law. But so in that, in that, in that moment, the architecture uh, make the jump and the trump, in a way, of the of the of the problem, but um, and it performs well and it's safe and it's beautiful and people use it, etc. But there's also the, the possibility, as Iñaki was saying, about testing the streetscapes or other uh, things that can be tested at that small scale, and then this is a proof of concept mm. for potentially changing policy. So I think it, it can be the two ways around. So policy informs design, design can inform policy. I think I'll suggest this to the folks who run City Park. We have a new activity there that could use, be used to justify water storage. Yes, <laughs> That's also why none of you have closets in your home, as little nuances like that. So um, we've got uh, some time for uh, questions in the audience. Does anybody? Right here, you're the first one up. I'll repeat the question. I can hear you. Yeah, so the question was about the $15 billion spent um, post-Katrina on the hurricane storm surge risk reduction, the HIZRA system, and um, how that relates to um, uh, the, the, the stormwater and the conversation in New Orleans. Do you have any comments? Well, it really doesn't. Uh, that, 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 that the, uh, the $15 billion was put to great use. It had to happen. Uh, we were behind 30 or 40 years from the promises made after Betsy that were never delivered on in terms of uh, being able to protect from Category 3 uh, level storms. And that system that we have now was hardening the wall to keep outside water from coming in. And that's very important. It's of extreme importance. I would like to see more coastal restoration, buffering that so we don't only rely on these rigid walls that is a mindset can be traced back to 1719. But what we're talking about here is, is water of an internal nature of a different scale. The, the mecha, if, if I may, the mechanisms that we're talking about here and the interventions we're talking about here are not going to prevent catastrophic Katrina-like flooding. It's a different, it's a whole different, what they're going to ameliorate is the nuisance flash flooding that we're seeing more and more of. So that distinction has to be, uh, if you have a catastrophic levee breach that brings in eight feet of water, uh, a retention pond ain't gonna do much, okay? It's, it's for all of those smaller level. And uh, to come back to David Wagner, he went out on that uh, January 2006 trip of many people took to, to the Holy Land, to Netherlands, 
distance to see these big barriers. And his wonderful moment there was that everyone was on the bus going three hours out to see the barrier. He was looking out the window, and what he was seeing was this water storage landscape. And so what he came back was, you know, we need the levees and we need the flood walls, no question, but let's also talk about this internal water management. You know, I'll say, uh, next question, but I'll say on the Dutch, one of the things we always have to uh, remind them of is that in 1953, when they had their Katrina moment, they came to the expertise on the Mississippi River Delta at the Waterways Experimentation Station. So although the Dutch have been doing it for a long time, um, we have too, and, and there's expertise here. And um, I, I, I love the shared conversation between us and the Dutch. Yes. The, the question was on path dependency and how it relates to some of the larger ecosystem uh, uh, programs that are going on, like the mid bear Terrace sediment diversion, and how um, we are rethinking these things and if we're doing it the right way. Uh, there's really two questions. One was uh, on this phenomenon of path dependency, and then more specifically the mid barataria diversion. Um, uh, I can't answer your second question. Um, I think ultimately, and I think many of you know that the, uh, this is at Myrtle Grove opening up <coughs> the west bank of the river to pulsate fresh water with its suspended sediment in the column in the hope of building new land. Uh, if that all does happen, that would be in the interest of the general region, particularly the city, in absorbing storm surge, et cetera. For the people who live there who depend on fisheries, it's the exact opposite. It's going to radically change the salinity regime and the fisheries and the valuable fish and oysters, et cetera. I think ultimately, I can't answer the modeling question about are they doing this right, but I think ultimately this is a a values question. And if you think back on ethics, uh, there's, I think it's called deontological re reasoning that holds everyone to this high standard and we got to keep that standard. And then there's utilitarian ethics that speak to doing the greatest good for the greatest number. I'll let you decide on that. But to your first question of path dependency, so long as we're human beings doing the best that we can with the information we, that we have at hand, we're going to make path decisions. Some of them will be the right ones, and some of them are going to, in time, prove to be wrong. I, I don't think we could ever get around it, but if we think long and hard on unforeseen consequences, and this is when the, 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 the studio sessions and, the, and the, uh, the, the, the critical reviews of each other try to tease out these potential problems now rather than later, that's where that comes in. We can take maybe one more question. Please use one of the microphones if you have a question. Can you please step up to the microphone if you have a question so everyone can hear you? I would bring it over to you like Donahue, but they're kind of locked in place. So. <laughs> Path dependency. <laughs> Path dependency, zing. Hi, I've been in a long time visit now to the city and in places like Homer Plessy by the train tracks, in other areas, I've seen water bubbling up in the streets, and it goes on for weeks. So there must be other places like this. What can be, or is anything being done about these places? Is it a broken pipe? What's happening in the city where water is just coming up and coming up, and uh, nothing seems to be done yet about this water emerging from wherever it's coming from and flooding? That sounds like it might be a broken water main. Uh, so uh, as opposed to a drainage uh, problem, it sounds like this is water being drawn out of the river for our drinking water. And to make it worse, that's already cleaned water. So that's potable water that's spilling out here. And many of our potholes, sometimes they're blamed on geology and subsidence in the deltaic plain. But what they are are underground versions of that. The water main breaks. It spills out water, it hollows out a cavity, people drive over it, and eventually the cavity is so big that the top collapses into it. So problems beget problems, yeah. Yes, because I have some pictures of ducks landing <laughs> and having fun in these pools. This is a very important migratory bird uh, flyway, so we, uh, <laughs> we love having habitat for them. Um, you know, and that hits on one of the balances here, which is that in infrastructure um, and, and the innovative projects, right? And that's one of the things that the three panelists here are working on every day. So please give everyone a round of applause. Go buy their books. 
and send your children to their classes.